Thanks, Ray. And, uh, and thanks to all of you at, at Lisbon YC for, for coming out here for this. Um, looks like there's a little bit of a microphone challenge here. I'll, I'll just, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I'm here to talk about uh, functional reactive programming. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of overview of, of how I arrived at, at the functional reactive programming you know, idea. Um, not my idea. I, 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 I say I arrived at it uh, by you know, going through, reading lots and lots of things. And, and over the years, it's something that's, that's just seemed uh, very, very useful to me. So um, I want to talk about it today. I want to show you some stuff that I've built. Um, and uh, and please, uh, you know, any questions that you have, you know, I think that as much of a discussion as this can be as possible, uh, the better. Um, so, so first of all, uh, I've been working in Haskell uh, for a pretty long time now, uh, about a decade, and uh, I got into Haskell because I was really drawn by the principles uh, behind functional programming in general. Uh, you know, this is something that I think uh, the, the Haskell community and the Lisp community and, and a few other communities really share. You know, uh, you know, we think in terms of declarative uh, things. Uh, we try to, you know, express as much as we can in a pure non-side effect based way. Um, you know, we like to have really powerful abstractions. Um, you know, in Haskell that, that might mean monads and in, in Scheme or Lisp that might mean macros. Um, and I think each has the other, but the, the sort of the tendencies. And so all of these things have been extremely useful to me, but when I started looking into how I could build user interfaces, video games, other kinds of interactive software, what I found was that it was very difficult to express my ideas in a purely declarative way. Uh, I found myself resorting to things that really resembled um, imperative programs that I had written in C++ whenever I was dealing with that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I, read, I wrote, uh, you know, some stuff in, in Haskell to do um, everything from, from web programs to, to, uh, to games, but they all had this, like, you know, they had IO refs all over the place. That's the Haskell, uh, you know, mutable data cell. Um, and it just felt wrong. It really crushed my productivity. I mean, I think I was still more productive than I would have been in a non-functional language, but it felt much closer to writing in C++ than it did to writing regular everyday Haskell. And so about four or five years ago, I started learning as much as I could about functional reactive programming, which is something uh, that Connell Elliott, uh, Paul Budak, and a, and a few other guys came up with as a response to this. Um, and what I've found since then is that it's been an extremely uh, elegant paradigm for expressing things. Uh, you know, I've been able to write things that I certainly wouldn't have been able to write without it. Um, and, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a flavor of, of why I feel that way uh, today. So uh, on Friday when I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do for this talk. Um, I thought it would be interesting for, for me to learn a little bit more about Lisp, um, particularly learning about Scheme. Um, and so I decided that I would put together a uh, sort of notebook um, that lets you run a Scheme in the browser uh, and interactively get uh, feedback from, from your Scheme. Um, and so what you see on the screen right here is actually uh, a program written with Reflex um, that is a scheme interpreter as well. Uh, and you can run it in your browser. Uh, it's available at uh, reply.obsidian.systems. Um, so for anyone who has a laptop, you can feel free to pull that up and show me just how broken uh, my project is. Um, <laughs> but uh, for a couple of days of work, uh, I think it, it's working uh, about as well as I could hope. Um, and uh, and so I want to I want to use this as a as a way to demonstrate some of the principles uh, of functional reactive programming. So what I used to build this um, is Reflex and Reflex DOM. Now Reflex is my functional reactive programming engine, um, and this uh, I, I did some research on on Lisp based things. The closest thing that I could find out of Lisp community is uh, something called Cells. 
which adds a reactive component uh, to class objects. Uh, it looks really cool. Uh, it looks like the project is a little bit abandoned. I'm not sure. Yeah, so this is a project that was done by Kenny Trotter, uh -huh. who is actually one of the co-founders of Wisdom IC. Oh, okay. Now it's in Florida. Uh -huh. um, and it's actually a very cool uh, technology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really liked what I saw there. I, I wasn't really fully able to, to, to grasp everything he was talking about, but uh, the reactive components uh, definitely shared uh, you know, a lot of their, their uh, underlying stuff, as far as I can tell, uh, with Reflux. Um, and then Reflux DOM is a library that, that provides uh, a FRP-based uh, DOM manipulation library. And you can actually see it in action here. So uh, this is uh, the DOM that I've built. And up here is the code that builds that DOM. So for example, if I were to change this to, um, let's see, to that, you know, and an update um, right down there. And so this is a, a little, basically, port of Reflex DOM to Scheme uh, that runs in the browser here. Um, and this code uh, with the, you know, element building and all that kind of stuff is, is similar to what you'd see in Haskell. Now, just before the talk, uh, someone asked me, you know, what is the distinction between reactive programming and functional reactive programming? Um, and it's a very interesting question because almost all reactive programming libraries like Rx Java and those kinds of things um, use functional principles to an extent. So they almost all have, you know, they, they use lambdas and things like that. But the really key distinction is that when I talk about functional reactive programming, I'm talking about doing reactive programming without including any side effects. So in Rx Java, you know, the, the standard way to do things is that you do have these pipelines of effects and things like that, but, but you still end up doing uh, side effects in the middle of your pipeline, you know, sending things out and, and you know, grabbing things into an IO. Um, and the key to FRP is that it provides you a sufficiently rich set of primitives that you never have to go outside the paradigm. You can always do everything in a totally pure way. Um, so that's, that's really, you know, key to uh, getting the kind of software architecture that I like to have in my programs. Um, so going back to uh, basics here, Here's a reflex DOM example that doesn't actually use reflex at all. This is just how we build elements. Um, and actually, I, I updated my macro a little bit earlier so that uh, you don't have to include the, the text form uh, around uh, text elements. But um, you can see that you know, this is pretty simple stuff. Now, let's try to do something more interesting here. Um, so here we can do a text box, and this is going to produce uh, what you see here, and we're taking the text input, so I can actually, let me delete uh, this part for a minute. So now we're just building the text input, right? I can type stuff into it. All right, cool. But if I want to also show the output of this, uh, I'm going to need some way of doing that. So. I have a function called dime text, which will take its input, which is a dynamic reflex value, and it'll put it right into <coughs> the dime. So now when I type there, it appears right after it. Now I can also uh, do a little bit of formatting here. So I can say, uh, well actually, let's, let's break this out first. Um, Okay, so I've defined a variable, and you can see that it's a, it's a Haskell uh, dime list value. Um, and then, uh, to get back to where I was, I can say uh, dime text x. All right, that's got the same behavior as before. Uh, but now I can go ahead and wrap this. Uh, Now they're in separate divs, so they're going to be on different lines. So as you can see, 
um, you know, this is allowing me to mix my uh, reactive logic uh, along with my DOM. Now you can also, basically this, this gives you a very uh, personal stylistic uh, choice here, which is how much mixing do you want. Why right. don't I have a TPL on a required system? I can oh. getting an unbound variable on the TPL. Yeah, me too. Well, <laughs> this is something I probably should have mentioned. Uh, so the primitive here is actually um, called evaluate element, or eval element. And uh, I, I wrote myself a little macro here, which uh, I really don't know how to write macros properly, but, but this is what I did. And, and so uh, L adder builds you an element with some attributes. And really all I needed was for these, um, these things to be quoted. Uh, and I wasn't sure how to expose that directly in the scheme interpreter that I'm using, which is, by the way, Husk scheme. Uh, it's a, it's a Haskell-based uh, scheme library. So we don't have any on that. We don't, but uh, you know what, let's, let me just, uh, these are really the two big ones that I'm using. So, um, are you guys on IRC? I, if you go into the, the Lisp uh, NYC, Lisp NYC. Oh, sure, I'll do that. Very good point. With no comments at all. You know what? You didn't watch the video. You're not here enough to do that. So that'll take uh, just a sec here. And we can paste those into the evaluation box. Yep.
right. Can everyone see that? All right. So what we have here is uh, a type class called Monad File System. Now, Monad is a type class um, that represents some type that has the ability to, to sort of work like uh, a sequence of operations. Um, and so M here is the type of some, uh, it's some monadic type. And what we're saying is that this is just like a superclass in any uh, in, in any other uh, system of, of classes. Um, so we're saying that if you give <coughs> uh, a monad, then you can also add file system capabilities to it. So this allows me to specify which monads in the program support file system operations. And you can see here that uh, you've got uh, you know does file exist, read file, remove file. You know, so that's that's the small set of functionality that was necessary to get uh, library loading in there. Remove file probably wasn't necessary, but I just tossed it in because it was easy. Um, and and so the way that this works um, is actually uh, pretty cool. So so the interesting thing is so here's the implementation if you're in IO, right? The so IO is the probably the most well-known monad around. That's that's sort of the base level monad that Haskell uses. IO lets you invoke C functions. Uh, it lets you, you know, basically do anything. You can do like pointer arithmetic, and you can seg follow your program if you want in IO. Um, so this is where I started uh, with Husky Scheme. Everything was in IO, and so I said, okay, let me define this particular subset of the functionality, um, and let me then interpret uh, IO as one of, as an instance of that type of. So now I've inserted an abstraction layer between the program, which had been doing the I.O. directly. Now it's going through my interface that I just defined. Right? And so what I did then is I changed, uh, let's see if I can find the function. So yeah, so I changed load. Right? So now load used to have this type. All the M's were replaced with I.O. And uh, don't don't worry about this I/O here. Uh, that's referring to Lisp, the Lisp notion of I/O. Um, but what this was saying before is that load needs to run on the bare metal hardware, right? Which of course means that in the browser it's sort of you know dicey whether it's going to do anything or, or crash you know the, the JavaScript or whatever. Um, but by factoring <coughs> out here into this separate monad, what I was able to do is just say, okay, well, load doesn't actually care what uh, environment it's running in. It just cares that it has access to a file system. And then what I did is I just followed all the compiler errors. So I just I just had a you know sort of REPL kind of setup. Um, I have something that, that just whenever a file changes, you know, reloads it, uh, pretty standard stuff. And then I just pushed this type change through everywhere in the program that I could get. It took about 10 minutes. Um, and what that meant is that Everything that was accessing the file system in the in the chain of things necessary to load something in the scheme is now abstracted out. And so in my actual program, here we have an in-memory file system. And this is something that you know I just tossed together uh, that is using um, the standard library provides a state transformer monad, so you can take any monad and add stateful uh, operations on top of it. Um, and so this just uh, you know has a state which you can get. That's all the files in the file system, and then it'll tell you whether whether it exists in that map. So um, you know this is an example of something that I think is, is very powerful about Haskell, uh, which is that I was able to do this refactor in a code base that I've never seen before. Um, in just, I mean, like, all of my refactoring to factor up file systems, console I.O., um, a few other things, um, random number generation or serial, serial number generation for, like, GenSim and that kind of stuff, um, all those refactors took, took maybe, like, six hours. Um, just from having sat down and, and just push these interface changes through the, through the system. Um, and so now, 
it's not running in idle, it's just running in my custom in-memory monad, um, which is how I'm able to run it in a browser. So I really like the fact that uh, you retype things again, and you're actually using a lot of parentheses, but yeah. that's one of the you're using dollar signs to avoid this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, actually, you can't use dollar sign in types uh, in Haskell. Uh, it, only, it only operates at the back <coughs> um, But uh, it does have a, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of niceness to it. But I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make that argument. Here. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so anyway, that's the that's the basic um, thing that goes here, and, and you can see that. Uh, let's see. So I've also uh, eventually list t. So I ended up with this list t monad transformer, and this lets you take any monad and add a scheme interpreter engine on top. Uh, and that's how everything in this program works. Um, and the, the nice thing about this is that um, reflex dom is also a monad transformer, and so. What we end up with is that this M gets filled in with the monad from reflex DOM, which lets us draw DOM elements. It gets extended with a Lisp environment, and then Lisp primitives, anything that would be a primitive in Lisp, is actually running in the reflex DOM monad, which means it can emit uh, DOM elements and it can you know draw things on the screen, do whatever it needs to do. Um, so uh, you know that's why. Uh, when I say, you know, uh, when I get into like define x text input, right? So the the evaluation of a scheme statement uh, can insert things into the DOM as part of its uh, side effect, um, and that's because I've defined this this monad which tracks those side effects. And it happens to be uh, a reflex DOM based model. So that's that's very cool stuff about Haskell uh, or whatever, but it doesn't actually have too much to do uh, with FRP. Um, so I'll, I'll pick back up where we left off and uh, and go through a little bit more of this example. So um, so one of the interesting things here, and this is something that uh, maybe at the bar afterwards, some people can tell me about the the implications of doing something like this. But you can see that. Uh, the environment inside uh, my L macro is actually seamlessly passing through into the external environment. Uh, and this is something that I found really useful um, compared with, uh, actually compared with the Haskell version where you have to do all this passing explicitly. Um, it's, it's sort of nice to be able to just you know define a, a symbol uh, and it goes into the global scope uh, or goes into whatever local scope you're in. Uh, and yet it's still like inside of a div. Uh, so that, that was kind of cool. Yep. Could, you, could you swap it around and go define x to be el div text input instead? I think so. That seems like too many parts. And that's how it would be defined in Haskell. So in this particular case, uh, it doesn't really make much of a difference, but um, it's globally bound to the DOM. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's well, it's globally bound to the uh, to the output. Oh yeah. Yeah, and this is one of the things that once you get into pure FRP, um, it takes some getting used to. That it's just like pure functional programming. If something is an input to a module. It's an input to the function. If something is an output from a module, it's a return value of the function. There is no like passing in a pointer and then it gets set. There's no you know returning something and then you know calling a function on it to push more data in. It's very very strict data flow. Inputs go in the argument list and outputs are the return line. And that's it. That's it. Um, by the way, were you guys able to get those uh, macros? Yes. Awesome. Yes, I pasted them in the work. Great. When I actually type in like the L H one O O, I don't get all of the work, so it's just yeah, straight. There's gonna be one. Oh no. Huh. That's pretty odd. Awesome.
Um, maybe the CSS is a little bit different. Yeah, maybe. Okay. All right, so uh, let's do something that actually involves a little bit more like reacting to the environment. Um, here we have sort of the most straightforward way to build uh, a button that counts uh, how many times it's been clicked. So we can say uh, button, and that's going to build this button. You can see it down here. We have this function count, and we display the output. And so you can see that whenever I click it, it goes up. So that's very straightforward. I think, for me, it's helpful to look at the type of this count function. So I'll just... Uh, Well, actually, never mind. Uh, <laughs> that's going to take too long. But, but basically, um, a count is going to take an event, and then it's going to produce a dynamic value. Now, an event is a series of occurrences throughout time. So uh, whenever the event fires or occurs, you can do something in response to it. Um, so I can show you actually how this looks uh, without types. You can see that we've got an event here. We can then count it. And that's giving us a dynamic. And the dynamic changes from time to time, but it always has a value. So that's the distinction between an event and a dynamic. A dynamic always has a value, and it will let you know when it changes. An event doesn't have a value most of the time, but it has a value when it's firing. Uh, this is something that's also in that cells library. Uh, they have I think they call it transient or, or something like that. Um, and that's a value that you know gets populated and then goes away. Uh, so that's something that you really need uh, to, to turn this into a, like a full-fledged system. So you, know, you can think of a spreadsheet as kind of like being uh, a big system of dynamic values. You, know, you have a cell, and whenever you change that cell, any cell based on it is going to automatically uh, you know, re-update. Uh, that's, I think, why the library is yeah. called cells. Yeah. Um, but the key thing to add on top of that, if you really want to be able to do whatever system you want, uh, is events. Uh, because they allow you to ex express not just a pure computation based on d uh, data that might change, but you can actually express stateful computation. And that's what this count function is doing. Um, so let's go back to the text. And you know you can see how that works. So dying text just takes whatever you give it and, and displays it. All right. So here's a little bit more, uh, you know, more complexity here. So we can actually, uh, you know, map over dynamic values. So this uh, expert input is going to be a dynamic string because we're constructing a text input and then it, that's what it returns. Now, I can type garbage into this, and that's not very helpful, but if I start typing a number in, it's actually gonna run this lambda that we put here uh, whenever the data changes, and then update this dynamic text on the other end. And this is just using the standard um, string to, to number conversion routine in Scheme. And I really wasn't sure what the right way to handle an exception here was, so I just appended a zero, and that seemed to make it always work. Um, but uh, you know, uh, this is this is a uh, very straightforward way to manipulate a uh, value that's changing over time. Now, you might also want to be able to combine multiple values, uh, and so what I've done here is I've made uh, map dine. Uh, be a variadic function. And so you can actually take uh, as many different dynamic values as you want, combine them together, uh, and get a dynamic result. So in this case, what I've done is I've made a div that has uh, inside another text input, and we're calling its result expert2. And then I'm defining a new dynamic value called both by doing a map dynamic string append 
over these two inputs. And then I just put that right on the screen. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is not doing much in the way of circularity checking. If you build something, so right now you can't actually build anything circular in Scheme. Um, in, uh, in the Haskell library, you can build circular things, uh, but I wasn't able to figure out how to, how to get that uh, working with like begin or something like that. It's, it's something where you, in, in Haskell we have laziness, yeah. and that just sort of handles the, the basics of it. Right. Um, and it, there is a certain extent to which it's on the programmer to make sure that their value doesn't lose. Right. Just like with any you know, term complete language, if you have uh, something that, that could potentially loop, um, it's not always possible to detect that. Um, but uh, we do create as many primitives as we can to try to reduce the kinds of situations where someone might run into that. Um, so, for example, in Reflex DOM, uh, I've been very careful to make sure that everything's very lazy. Uh, so, you know, if you create some input down below and then you use it up above, that's pretty much always going to be fine, so unless you actually create something. Like how it creates a yeah, so I, I just don't have syntax for that in the scheme um, bindings. Um, but but yeah, the way that it works in, I, I can show you an example of how that works in uh, the Haskell version. This is perhaps not the Let's find a kind of small one. Yeah, so, so here you can see uh, this block here. Um, what's going on is we're creating a, an element uh, with dynamic attributes to span. And you can see this is pretty similar to the way that it works in the scheme code. Um, and it returns open and close. And then Open and close are both used inside of the block itself. Um, oh, no, no, this is not the cycle, actually. The, the, the real cycle here is that we have open and close, which we construct inside of here. They go down to hover. So you can see that, let me, let me make this a little bit wider. Um, Okay, so actually, I'll, you know, I'll take a minute to, to explain uh, this function. Um, this is something that's actually not in use in the code base right now. Uh, this is able to do a little bit of pretty printing on a scheme value. Um, and, and so the way that it works is uh, it creates a span uh, around your uh, overall S expression. Um, and then for the open and close parentheses, uh, it, it also creates uh, spans around those, so that way we can detect clicks on them and hover over them and things like that. And so those elements then get returned as the open and close uh, values here. Then, in order to get the uh, hover state of the overall uh, S expression so that we can highlight it, um, we use the mouse enter and mouse leave events in the DOM. Um, and what we do here is, so fmap is going to just run this function on uh, the contents of the event. Now the contents of the mouse enter and mouse leave event are just unit. They're, they're, it doesn't have any useful data. Um, but we're going to replace that value with true for enter and true for this enter. And false for leave, false for leave. And then what we do is we use this, con this uh, function called hold, hold dime. Uh, it's going to take an initial value, and then it's going to take another event. And whenever the event fires, it's going to replace the value of the dynamic value. So hover is going to initially be false, and then if the user puts their mouse into one of the open or closed parens, uh, that's going to cause the hover to change state. And then when they take the mouse back out, it's going to change state back. Um, so you can see that you know being able to analyze this in place is one of the huge advantages of FRP. We don't have to look 
and anything else in the entire program to know how this hover is going to work. We only have to look at its definition because nothing that comes after is allowed to impact it. Nobody can say like, you know, hover dot set value. There's no such thing. All the ways that the value are uh, that the value can be set is described here. What is the definition? Leftmost is uh, a combinator that combines events, and in the situation where two of them are simultaneous, it takes whichever one is left in your list. Uh, there are all kinds of different combinators for combining events, um, but this is actually a key design point for Reflex um, itself. In some FRP systems, they have some way of, of sort of like interleaving or, or automatically picking an order uh, for events that are simultaneous or nearly simultaneous, but in Reflex, we always force you to resolve the simultaneity at the point where you create it. Um, and the main way that events are simultaneous with each other uh, is if they have the same source. So in this case, we can be pretty certain that they're not going to be simultaneous, um, because you can't have, just the way the DOM works, you can't have simultaneous enter, leave, enter on a different element and leave on a different element. So uh, we can just combine it with leftmost and not really worry about it. Um, but can you give an example of a simultaneous DOM? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so so the simplest way to have a simultaneous event here would just be if I did this, right? Oh, okay. So now this is going to be exactly the same event. And I could even do something like, you know, this would obviously be a near bug in the code, you know, so that would be wrong, right? Now, since we're using leftmost, that actually wouldn't matter. But if instead I did this, now the true is going to take precedence. So that's something where, uh, I mean, this is sort of a silly example, um, but in complicated systems, you often have some event that causes lots and lots of things to happen. Um, and if you're using something like the you know, publish subscribe uh, pattern, um, then you often end up with these situations where like a bunch of updates are happening uh, and you don't know what order they're going to happen in. Right? Something changed, it notifies everything else that it changed, and they go and notify their other stuff, and notify goes down the chain in this huge tree. And there are two big problems with that. One is that it's really slow because you might end up with this diamond shape where you have one notification that notifies two things and then they both notify the next thing over, right? And if you get a couple of those diamonds in a row, each time you double the number of notifications that are going through. And that can really blow up in your program really fast. The second problem is that by the time you get to the end of a really complex series of notifications, if there's any order dependency in terms of how your stuff works, you're going to have an impossible time trying to debug it. Um, and you know, if you're using callbacks, there probably is going to be order dependency because callbacks are fundamentally side effect based. Right? Generally, callbacks don't return anything. And if you're not returning anything, you're either useless or you're creating some kind of side effect. So callbacks are usually side effect based. Side effects are usually order dependent, and so if you're getting notifications and using them to call side effect, uh, to call callbacks, you're probably going to have some order dependency that's going to be impossible to debug. So, in Reflex, we solve both of these issues by very carefully maintaining the graph of notifications and only propagating each notification zero or one times per frame. So there's no way that an event can fire multiple times in a frame in Reflex. Uh, and that helps us with performance and makes it possible to comprehend what the program is actually going to do. Um, okay, so then continuing to, to trace this down here, um, the, <clears throat> the uh, hover style, uh, it looks like that's been commented out. This is, as I said, this is not because it's actually in use. Um, but uh, the hover style uh, could be a dynamic value, for example, based on uh, the current hover, uh, and then also the environment. And then that would just be, you know, we build up some CSS classes here that are going to create a highlight and all that stuff. And then hover style comes back up here, and it gets used as the attributes for this element. So 
that's an example of something where you've got a recursive um, approach here, right? So open and close come out of this element, and then eventually they influence the attributes of, the, of that element. Um, this is very common in functional reactive programming. And in fact, this recursive approach is what allows you to create safe local state variables in an FLP program. So if you, uh, if you didn't have this cyclic kind of thing, you'd kind of be forced, then basically you, you could never update a state based on its old state. So the cycle is, is really what gives you this notion of local state. So here it's the old, it's the old cover strategy you use and then the new one, or? Uh, Sorry, say that again? So how do you make the difference between the old and the new, or everything that's the input is the old and everything that the output is the new, or? Yeah, so the, actually the way it works with dynamics is that in reflex, a dynamic value is a combination of a lower level thing called a behavior and an event. A behavior is kind of like a dynamic value. It's always got a value. But the thing about behaviors is that they don't notify you when they change. They're really much more like a spreadsheet cell. Um, so they will update their value, but they never uh, tell you that they've updated their value until you ask. So a dynamic, <coughs> combines both sets of functionality. It will notify you with an event uh, whenever it changes, and it will also allow you to sample it whenever you want. Um, and so when you have something uh, like this, what, what we could do, for example, is we could say, let's say somehow hover changes without really changing, right? So it's, uh, it, you know, it's false, and then it gets set to false again. I don't think that's actually possible here, but it could happen in, in many different circumstances. So the way we could get rid of that is we could say, um, uh, let's see. So first we can start by doing uh, all right, so I'm going to leave this function here empty. Now. But what we've got here is the current, which is the behavior value of hover. And we've got updated, which is the event value of hover. Now, updated is an event that's going to fire every time the dynamic changes value or potentially changes value, basically every time it's recomputed. Um, and current is that you know lower level cell value, the current value of the, of the dynamic. Now the interesting thing, this is another design choice in reflex. Event propagation happens instantaneously and then behavior recalculation happens after that in another instantaneous step. And the really cool thing about that is that if we attach these values together, whenever the updated hover event fires, it's going to get the old value in the current and this ends up working actually pretty elegantly in a lot of situations. So, um, you know, in the situation where it's not currently changing, you can always access the current value. But when it is changing, you get to see the old and the new values. And it turns out that that having this complete, uh, you know, instantaneous separated phase approach uh, is something that a, a couple of the FRP engines have landed on. Uh, and I think that it, it makes things pretty comprehensible. There are a few FRP engines where behaviors will change immediately upon receiving new data. Uh, but that makes it really, really hard to know when you can sample it and when it will be old and when it will be new. So I, I like this approach. Um, and so then if I wanted to actually uh, you know, filter out redundant changes here, what I could say is old, new. Okay? And then I could say uh, if old equals new, then uh, nothing. Uh, else just new. And so this is going to give me an event that gives me the new value anytime it's actually new. Uh, attach with maybe uh, is the primitive that, that does this combination of a behavior and an event. Um, there are a couple of different primitives like this, but you can just think of it like, you know, whenever the event fires, goes by, grabs the value of the behavior, and then continues on its way. The result is also an event. Um, so that, that's you know that's one of the one of the low level things we got here. So is this 
from this really eventually really through like polling which we talked about sampling, sampling the value bonds. So reflex is fully push pull. And what that means is that some things are polling based and some things are completely push driven. And it's actually up to the programmer to decide what that is. And then frameworks like Reflex DOM can provide sensible defaults for all that kind of stuff. So when you have a behavior, uh, as I said before, it doesn't notify you when it changes. And the reason for that is that it doesn't actually necessarily change when it changes. Uh, it doesn't actually compute it until you look at it. So it's going to be completely lazy. So like, let's say you have an expensive computation. Uh, for example, uh, evaluating a whole bunch of list code, right? So, uh, you know, if, when I have that whole document there, um, that's true. It's expensive in, in my interpreter. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so if you want to, you know, evaluate a whole bunch of stuff, um, you can create a behavior that is, you know, that evaluation applied to some source behavior. <coughs> now, if that source behavior changes very frequently, you don't want to spend all the CPU time recomputing it every single time. Um, and so the way that Reflex handles that is that whenever it changes, it's going to basically wipe out all the pre-calculated values, but it's not going to recalculate them until you need them. So if it changes a thousand times and then gets read once, you're only going to pay once for the evaluation. Then it can change another thousand times and get read again. <laughs> and each time you only pay when you read it. Then if you read it multiple times, that's also free. So you basically pay once per change that gets read. Um, so that's the pull-driven part of the reflex implementation. And then the push-driven part uh, is also very important because like, one, of the, one of the big problems with early FRP systems was that they tended to reevaluate all of the reactive values in the system, each frame, or at least some large subset of them. Um, and that was just because you know, the algorithms to do this uh, had not yet been you know, figured out. Um, and the way that the reflex does it basically is that it maintains this almost topologically sorted graph in memory at all times. And why when an event, huh? why unload? Because it's cheaper than being fully topologically sorted. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's like a, it's just strong enough of a constraint to guarantee that everything is going to work properly, um, but it's not quite as strong as a full topological sort. Um, and so it's still a partial order. Yeah, it's basically a partial order. Um, and and so when when we have uh, events propagating through the system, the the real key thing here is that we need to be able to uh, figure out which events might be firing, then determine whether they're firing. But we can't look at all the events that aren't firing. Okay. And so Reflex will traverse this graph, and whenever it gets to a node that needs more data, um, the, one of the really interesting cases is merge. So if you have a whole bunch of events merging together, this is a fully deterministic system. So if I'm propagating the first event and I get to that merge in my graph, I need to know, in order to propagate the value past that, I need to know whether any of the other input events are fired. I'm not allowed to just sort of proceed from there because then I might, you know, it might depend on which order the events are coming in, in and that's that's going to be too confusing. So by maintaining this almost topological sort, what we're able to do is hit that merge, and then we know how long we have to delay for to wait until all the other events come in on their own. And so we never actually check even if you merge together a thousand events, we only pay log n of a thousand to do this merge successfully. And actually, we only pay the log of the firing events. So if you have a thousand coming in, you don't have to pay for that. You only have to pay for the thousand that are firing if there are a thousand firing. Yeah. So who's assuming this is a bad idea? Here's my question. Uh, why would it be a bad idea to have behaviors um, kind of work kind of like a push by model where they would notify the party whether or not anybody responds to that story. And that's a little bit of a black hole. Yeah, yeah. Not sure so. Right. Well, so behaviors do do some internal notifications. So the 
you know, if you've got behaviors that are calculated because they've been looked at, then there is a push-driven erasure that happens. Uh, and that's basically because if you, if you try to pull that, that gets really expensive. Um, so you're absolutely right that pushing some of that stuff through uh, is helpful. But I also tried to, to do as little pushing with them as possible because I don't want to be aggressively updating. Right. Um, I only want you to pay for well, what you... Right, right. So you push it. That's what you're pushing. If you just push some notification that changed. Exactly. You're not pushing the change. Yeah, and yeah. people can respond to the fact that you yeah, yeah, yeah. not, right? Well, sort of. The, the issue with this is that, so... Oh, some people would be like, you've changed, I better reach value. Right, so imagine the situation where you have the behavior that changes a thousand times and yeah. it gets read once. Yeah. There's a big difference between propagating that I've changed notification a thousand oh. times and propagating it once. Right, so even if all your computations are very cheap, uh, or even if you aren't recomputing, you still don't want to push the change notifications all the way through the graph. And this is especially important, like if you're trying to push. Yeah, it's a lazy push. It only pushes to cells that are currently calculated. And they then erase themselves. But the ones that aren't calculated, and actually, one really interesting thing about this is, this is all lazy, and this is all garbage collected as well. Right? And that's one of the, just a quick aside, that's one of the, huge benefits of FRP over non-functional reactive programming. If you have a reactive program where, say, mapping over an event can cause a side effect, mm -hmm. then you can never garbage collect that correct that connection because somebody might be depending on that side effect to happen, even if the event on the output side is no longer used. Whereas with functional reactive programming, like in Reflex, you can garbage collect everything fully because you know that mapping over an event is not significant if that event isn't ever used. Um, so, but, but back to what you were saying, you know, I think that um, the key is we want to make sure that you never pay for stuff you're not using. So in a lazy system, there might be things, there might be behaviors whose value depends on your value, but it's lazy, so they've never been evaluated. It doesn't even really exist in memory. And it won't even spring into existence until somebody looks at it. When somebody looks at it, it'll allocate its little mutable cache cell, and then it'll subscribe to the guy it depends on. Um, and so there's certainly no way he could notify the non-existent child right, right, that he's changed. Right. Um, and, and so this is why um, there's this uh, dynamic and behavior distinction in Reflex, because behaviors are actually much more performant in many situations. Certain situations, it depends. In the DOM, everything has to be changed, you know, up front. Because the DOM doesn't the DOM doesn't ask you, right? When it's going to render, it doesn't say what's the text I'm supposed to put here. You have to change the DOM. And that's why in reflex DOM you see dynamic values all over the place. Because it's gotta it's gotta have the push and the pull component. But in various situations, you know, behaviors can be more performant. And so that's why those are the primitives in reflex. In fact, dynamics are entirely built just in a separate part of the library, they're not baked in at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's behaviors and dynamics. Um, cool, so any other questions about, uh, about this cover stuff before we move on? I have a quick question about your, um, your naming convention. How did you come up with the, with the name behavior? Yeah, so, so that's what, something... What, what are you thinking when you... That's something that I borrowed from Kyle Elliott. Uh, who's really the, he, he wrote uh, push-pull functional reactive programming and mm -hmm. Fran, and uh, I think he might have been involved in the Father Time, which I think is a racket-based uh, FRP implementation. Um, but, uh, you know, he came up with this terminology of events and behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that, that he definitely invented uh, a lot of the, the basic semantics of this paradigm. Um, and my semantics are slightly different from the ones that he put forth in his initial paper, uh, but you know I figured I, I'd pay homage to him uh, you know, where it's due. Um, cool. So uh, let's see. Uh, so so let's let's go back to this and, and think about the situation. So everything I've shown you up until this point is sort of a pure transformation. So we have an input. 
we transform it purely, and then we provide it as output. But we don't have any actual state. Um, and as I mentioned before, without recursion, we can't do really state that builds on itself. But we can do some stateful things. Um, and so here's an example uh, of what that would be. So here I created uh, another button, just like before. Uh, and then I'm using this called done, which you just saw uh, in the Haskell code as well. Um, and so I give it the initial value here. Um, and then I'm going to map over the button click in it. And in the function that I'm mapping over that, I'm going to sample the current value of the both dynamic. So if I type into this, you can see that the both value here is this, you know, one, two, three. This is based on combining these two uh, text boxes here. Uh, uh, and so, and this is not with the, the numeric conversion. So we've combined these two text boxes, and then when we click this button, it's going to save that down here. Right? And then we can change the text boxes some more. And this won't change until that event fires. So whenever the button gets clicked, this save val event fires. And then that's going to cause this function to run. And this function, because it's running in response to an event, it can sample any behaviors or dynamics uh, that it wants to. And it will get their value at the time that the event is fired. And then that replaces the value of the event. Uh, and that goes into this whole dyne, which updates the state of that dynamic value. So uh, then we just call that last val, and then we just output that. So you, know, you can see it's very simple to, to do something where we're actually grabbing data and, and putting it somewhere because we've made some kind of you know, event-driven decision. Um, all right. So uh, I have a couple of uh, more things to go through. Um, let's see. Do you guys usually take a break in the middle of the presentation, or we'll keep going? Okay. All right. So so here's an example where I'm going to show uh, how you can merge uh, events together. So here I've defined a function that will uh, create a button, and in addition to uh, creating the button, it also maps the resulting event to replace its value, which is just nil, uh, with the text of the button. So this is just a handy way of creating a button that can be identified somehow. So create that function, and then I can use it in this div, and that creates these three buttons. And so this is another example of how I can use hold time, but this time I'm using it with merge. So merge is going to merge together uh, these events. And uh, in the case of a simultaneous event, uh, what it's going to do is just turn it into a list. Um, so the result of this merge in the scheme side of things is always going to be a list. Um, and so if I click 1 here, you can see that my nil value is replaced with uh, the list of, uh, of just the number 1. Um, now, I can actually demonstrate the simultaneous events thing here. So I can change this to, to also include uh, 3 again. And then if I click 3, I get a list with the number 3 inside twice. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, all right, so then what you have here. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, this is this is just showing how I can uh, create a whole new widget on the fly uh, based on it. Oh, it just needs some initial value. Uh, okay, I could change that actually. So that could be, for example, um, the number five. Uh, so then it just re-rendered this widget, so it got its initial value, um, and then that will get your replaced. Yep. All right. Uh, and so here I can do something perhaps more interesting. So uh, last pressed. Uh, you know what? Let's uh, let's put something a little more interesting here. 
it, uh, it handles that problem by, you know, they've just put a ton of work into getting rid of side effects in almost every package out there. So um, it works really well. Yeah. Do, do you uh, use that, by the way? I do, yeah. I, I, I played around with it a couple of years ago. I wanted to replace Gen 2 with it, but I wasn't, uh, I mean, you know, there, there weren't enough packages, really, and I couldn't yep. quite get everything. So uh, I haven't checked out it recently, so uh, we'll, yeah, I yeah. think it's, so what do you think of it now at this point? I, I think Mix is great. I've been running it for a year and a half on my laptop, and I've been running it for about a year in production uh, for servers. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's got a lot of really great benefits. Um, I will say that it's a very difficult learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the way that, that I learned it was I basically sat down and like read the Nix manual and the Nix OS manual. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was able to use it before that, but like very barely, you know, I, I just sort of, but once I sat down and read it, it was it was much more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, Nix, N-I-X, yeah. And there's also a scheme-based um, yeah, the name of it. Yeah, G-U-I-X. Yeah, that's from the uh, Free Software Foundation. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds really cool too. It, which is, I think is kind of cool because yeah, it uses like a uh, list. It's much nicer than the syntax for Nix, I think. Yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, you know, okay. Nix. Syntax is ugly than Nix. I'm not really sure why they built their own programming language for it, um, but it is. I mean, it gets nicer to use. Like, it, it's not. It's not horrible. Um, it is a pure, lazy, functional language, so... How difficult is it to install Nix? There's no graphical installer, is that true? Uh, so, that is correct. There, there isn't a graphical installer, uh, but there is a graphical live CD. You boot on the live CD, and then you have to follow like a page of the manual uh, to partition it yourself, <coughs> and then run a command. Um, partitioning is like by far the bulk of the work you have to do yourself. Um, I'm sure that at some point in the future they'll, they'll put together a, a wizard for it or whatever, but um, but yeah, for now it is it is a pretty manual install. Um, one of the nice things is that uh, in Amazon it gets really really slick. So there's a script that will take so it, okay so in in uh, in uh, Nix a Directory, it generates everything. Um, 
And, and so I've definitely found that to be really useful. Yet another example of like pure functional programming um, really winning. Uh, you know, this, I mean, like here's my nginx config, right? This is this is configured with nginx and like a Haskell-based uh, backend server, um, which is uh, running via System D, which you may or may not like, but I mean it's possible to use things other than System D. Um, you know, even user management uh, for servers is usually handled uh, in a pure declarative way. Um, so yeah, I've definitely been a fan of it. And you know, I work on a lot of different projects. Um, and one of the great things about, about Nix is that I can go into a sandbox for a particular project. And it's not just like you know, a Haskell sandbox. It's a sandbox for the whole OS. So I have you know, whatever version of Postgres that uh, project is using. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you use Postgres, but like doing an upgrade of Postgres is actually kind of a pain because they don't guarantee binary compatibility between major versions. So you actually have to dump and reload your database. So I'd rather not, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and so project by project, I can do it instead of instead of doing it on my whole machine. Um, that so, upgrade yeah. also great. With Debian, I, I, I upgrade my system and the graphics card stops working. Mm -hmm. And now uh, I'm left with a machine totally unusable, or I mm -hmm. have to go back to my uh, backup if I have an up-to-date backup, and that's how. Uh, with, uh, with Nix, I upgrade. Most of the time it works. If it doesn't work, then fine. I can trivially the pure functional go back to the old system. Mm -hmm. and it's still there. Yeah. I'm yeah. a huge fan, so I'm definitely going to talk to you guys afterwards. <laughs> I need to get yeah, your cards. Yeah, yeah. You gotta get me up to speed on this because I wanted to use this. Because I, I have like a Gentoo server that's pretty much bit rotten at this point and yeah. I can't even update it anymore. And that's really a problem with Gentoo. Because if you're not constantly keeping up with and changing things, it just, uh, you can't upgrade anymore uh, safely. So I want to yeah. do something like this where you can just, when I need to upgrade, I can just do it. Yeah. And exactly like if it's screwed up, just go back. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's something I've, okay, I'm gonna talk about that. Cool. Um, yeah, so, so anyway guys, we've gotten pretty far afield now uh, from the original <laughs> talk. Uh, it's very interesting stuff and I'm more than happy to talk about it, but um, before before we, I think, call it a day, um, is there anything else that, that people would be interested in hearing about uh, Reflex or FRP uh, or anything like that? What are the major FRP libraries? Well, Reflex is, uh, I think, the major FRP library. Uh, you know, I, so, so there are a lot of um, libraries in and around the space of, of uh, FRP. Um, in Haskell, uh, there are a couple of other uh, notable ones. Um, there's, uh, let's see, there's Three Penny GUI, there's um, uh, one called Alaria. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Connell Elliott made one back in the day, which was called um, Reactive. Um, Heinrich Apfelmus has one uh, called uh, Reactive Banana. Um, there's, uh, there's one called Sodium. So there, there are a bunch of different ones. And uh, each of them has strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, with, with Reflex, uh, my goal was to provide one that didn't have any uh, sort of showstoppers, you know? Uh, because, like, Connell Elliott's implementation, for example, is actually really a beautiful implementation. He uses a multi-threading approach uh, to do the event merging in a way that's sort of like all implicit. Um, and the code looks great, but it doesn't run very well. You know, it's it's creating you know millions of threads for a simple thing, which Haskell's pretty good with threads, but it's not that good. Um, but uh, you know, I think that there's been a challenge. Um, like Yampa, for example, um, Paul Hudex uh, FRP. That's one of the ones I used in the early days, um, and it really contributed a huge amount to the community and to the, the thinking about FRP. Uh, but what I found with that particular implementation is because it was just a little bit too pure functional in terms of how it worked internally. White uh, holes. <laughs> yeah, it has black holes and white holes. That's a design choice more so than an implementation issue. Um, and I chose not to put those in reflex, but uh, I, I can get into why uh, some other time. But um, but with with Yampa, I, you know, I think that there was a lot of rewriting of the heap. Um, and so with reflex, I got really, really low level. Like if you read the core of reflex, it is not 
functional code at all. I mean, it's like, it's written in Haskell, but it's all heap traversals and mutable state bumping and all that kind of stuff. And that was what I needed to do in order to achieve, you know, really high performance. Um, and in fact, in the future, you know, one of the things that I'm going to improve is try to cluster your, you know, your, your sort of like under the hood state mutation into individual cache lines uh, so that there's less actual walking heap. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement still, but, you know, that was my focus because I really wanted something that I could use in production. You know, and, and all of the other things out there, you know, they mostly have memory leaks. Uh, they mostly have uh, asymptotic performance that blows up in situations that are pretty frequent. Um, as far as I know, Reflex doesn't have any major asymptotic blow-ups. So you really design performance? Yeah, performance. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So, so you use a slow level Z for performance, and yet GTJS compiles that to uh, JavaScript? Well, that's why it has to be so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, GCJS is surprisingly fast. Um, I, you know, I've done a little bit of benchmarking comparing GHC to GHCJS, and I, I found that GHCJS is usually within a factor of five um, of the performance. It does. Well, it doesn't directly, but it supports it. So, so like the the reply out of city dot systems is that's closure compiled. Uh, Reflex DOM is all closure compiler safe. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it is. It is hugely important. I mean, it, it usually compresses by like a factor of three or four. Um, so definitely important to page load times. Go ahead. Two questions that make the same question. Um, have you used Reflex on things other than websites? And um, and uh, how does like Reflex or Ruby change how you write CSS? Or does it? So, most of my work with Reflex has been for websites. Um, we do have a Gloss uh, binding, which is Gloss is a uh, OpenGL based um, educational uh, graphics library for Haskell. It's designed to be really simple for beginners. So, so we ported um, uh, we ported that thing's interface to Reflex, um, and so now there's a bit of an FRP binding for that. Um, I would say in terms of uh, oh, and so, so I haven't used it for like backend server stuff yet. Although there are some interesting possibilities for that, because uh, you know this this is taking care of a lot of the uh, state update stuff that the programmer usually has to think about. Uh, and so you know being able to stream notifications out of a database or something like that um, would be really great. Um, but in terms of CSS, it doesn't really change anything. Um, Reflex DOM produces exactly the DOM you tell it to. It doesn't add any IDs, it doesn't screw around with anything. So you can write the exact same uh, CSS that you would have written before, uh, or you can you know, I mean, change how you do it a little bit, but like, yeah, it doesn't. Um, I could imagine that like it might, there might be a minute, but I can keep writing the CSS the way I normally do, but is there yeah. some way that you can do it more easily now? Yeah, I would say that I use inline styles a little bit more uh, than I would if I were using pure CSS. Um, mostly for things that are really fundamental to the operation of a widget. Like, let's say I have, uh, you know, an accordion widget that can expand and contract. You know, and so it's creating a div and then it's using display none to hide the div, right? Now, to me, that's not really like a styling thing. It's either hidden or not. And the widget isn't going to work properly if it doesn't use that. So in Reflex, it's really, really easy to like dynamically add and remove that style. It's also really easy to dynamically add and remove classes. So you know, however you want to do it, um, you can. But but uh, yeah, I'd say if anything, maybe a little bit more use of, of inline styles for the for the like stuff that isn't really styled. You know? How many libraries or languages? I don't know of any serious FRP libraries that are language agnostic. Um, I think, I mean, Reflex might be the only one that supports two languages now. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. React. So, so React uh, and Reflex DOM occupy similar spaces. Uh, Reflex is lower level um, than that. Reflex is just uh, the core of Reflex is just about event and behavior propagation. And so you can use that in any context. 
Reflex DOM is the actual binding to the DOM library, and that's the thing that's comparable to React. Um, so there, there are strengths and weaknesses on both sides. Uh, I mean, the biggest strength React has is that it's got you know a lot of engineering behind it. It's got Facebook. It's got you know a lot of contributors. So at very low level uh, operations, uh, it's a little bit more optimized. You know, they, they've done more passes with that kind of stuff. There's a lot more plugins and integrations and things like that that you can just get off the shelf. Um, the advantage that Reflex DOM has is that you can write your widgets in a pure functional style. And that includes if you have arbitrary event flow patterns. So React kind of has a particular way that events flow around it, and that's sort of decided for you. Uh, in Reflex, there's just events. You can flow them wherever you want. So that's um, a Yeah, I think I think it's that you know React doesn't have the the like fundamental primitives of FRP, so it's sort of trying to build a sane flow, but it has to build a particular flow. You know, like they can't just make it polymorphic. You know, so in, in Reflex, the data flow goes wherever you tell it, and you never have to use side. Go ahead. Uh, so how would you compare reflex with Elm? With Elm? Elm. 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 Uh, yeah, so Elm uh, is something that I definitely took a lot of inspiration from when I was creating reflex. Uh, Elm uh, is, is really cool. It, it's, you know, it's, it's its own language designed to have really nice integration with JavaScript. Um, it's strict. Um, for, for me, there were a few things that, uh, that stood out as differences. The biggest one is that the FRP system in Elm is first order. And what that means is that you can't have uh, FRP values with FRP values inside. In Reflex, um, you can have a dynamic with a dynamic inside, or an event with a behavior inside, or anything like that. Um, and it all just sort of works exactly as you would expect. It, it follows simple laws that don't really care about that. Um, and there are some primitives, like you know, there's there's something called switch. You have if you have a behavior with an event inside, you can turn that into just an event, and the output event will fire whenever the current contents of that behavior is firing. So those kinds of primitives are really important, and the big thing that they let you do is create dynamically changing widgets. So if I were you know to to go to you know one of one of my uh, applications, uh, you know, we, we are constantly like building and destroying widgets. You know, it's a, it's a really like it's really difficult to write a business application or any complex application without being able to create and destroy widgets. Um, and in Elm, if you want to create and destroy widgets, you have to use primitives that that they've sort of constructed for it. And if those ones don't do what you want, then you kind of have to go down to the JavaScript layer and write those yourself. Because without the higher order kind of stuff, it, it's sort of like, imagine if I have a region that is a dynamic widget, and it returns a dynamic value, right? That's sort of a fundamentally higher order concept. You've got a thing that's dynamically changing with a dynamic result inside, and you need to be able to flatten that down. And that flattening operation uh, is what requires higher order effort. They actually do have a really interesting CSS replacement system, though. Uh, so that, that goes to your point. Uh, I think I saw another hand over here. here so I think what's the workflow of debugging and profiling? What are you Debugging and profiling. Um, well, I'm sure, as, as you all know, um, Haskell programmers don't ever have to debug anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> that helps. Uh, <laughs> uh, realistically speaking, the debugging is a lot less. Um, now, for this application, so this is actually not running in a browser right now. This is running, uh, well this is running as a binary, but I can also run it as a GHCI. I can just run it in the Haskell REPL. Um, so that's hugely beneficial. I can just pick out a particular piece of my program and say, okay, run this, and it'll pop 